It's no secret that words have power. A simple greeting can be the ray of sunshine that breaks through the clouds and brightens a stranger's day, while a condescending reply can be a dagger plunged straight into a lover's heart. The bards of Faerun know these lessons very well and have mastered the use of words and melodies as a means to focus their magics into the world around them. So if you are the type of player who gets joy out of assisting those that are closest to you, as well as literally adding insult to injury for your foes, then the Bard class is right for you. Welcome back, travelers. I'm glad to see you made it. I'm Colo, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Bard class in Baldur's Gate 3. We'll take a look at all the skills and abilities you'll get as you level up your Bard, and then we're going to come back at the end of the video and we'll look through each of the individual subclasses on their own. That way you know which route you want to take your Bard as you're leveling up. Also, a special shout out to the curators of the Baldur's Gate 3 wiki at bg3.wiki. These guys do a really good job compiling and organizing this data, and a lot of the information that I've used in this video has come from this website. So make sure you check them out, show them some love, they do a really good job over there. Also, stick around to the end of the video where I'll be talking about a few notable bards from popular media, and we're also going to cover one character who might secretly be a bard in disguise, but we'll have to figure that out together. Now, I'm going to shut up, shut up, and we can get started. In the worlds of the Forgotten Realms, where Baldur's Gate 3 takes place, bards are not merely musicians or performers. They are fully-fledged spellcasters who are capable of tapping into the power of the words of creation, which are said to be the words of the gods that were used to speak the world into existence in the first place. So that sounds pretty busted, and in the game what that translates to is your bard is basically going to be able to use either their voice or instruments to tap into that magical music or word power and cast spells with them. Bards get access to damaging spells, buffs, debuffs, crowd control, pretty much a little bit of everything, which is a common theme among bards. In bed. So the life of a wandering rock star appeals to you, and you want to make a bard. Well, that sounds great. Let's take a look at what you're going to get when you choose this class. When you first choose the bard class, you will immediately be granted a few things. First up, you're going to receive proficiency with light armor, simple weapons, hand crossbows, rapiers, long swords, and short swords. You will also get to pick your bard's starting instrument. This is not a set in stone thing. Any character that has the performance skill and is able to play instruments can play every instrument. So if you find a different instrument later on, you want to try it out, you can swap it out, no problem. You can do all that stuff without having an instrument equipped at all, and your character will actually whistle or sing for casting spells and whistling songs. It's pretty awesome that Larian actually took the time to script this whistling and get the voice actors to record the whistling scene so you can have access to this in the game. Whistling actually sounds pretty good when you put it with the other instruments as well, in case you end up with multiple performers in your group. If you wanna have one of them be a whistling musician, that's a perfectly viable option. I actually made a whole video about the performability, so feel free to check it out if you wanna learn more about that. You will also be granted two level one spell slots, as well as your choice of two bard cantrips and four level one spells from the bard spell list. When bards learn spells, they are always prepared, which means that you won't be preparing and unpreparing spells like a wizard has to do. You're just, every spell that your character learns as you level up, they have access to during the day. But because of this fact, bards learn less spells than the other classes do. You're going to have plenty of tools available for multiple situations on this character, though, I assure you. I've never found myself on my bard's turn without at least some kind of plan or something that I can do that's going to benefit the group in some way, whether that's throwing an off heel to help somebody, whether it's putting a offhanded crossbow shot into somebody from across the room to try to, you know, finish off that one enemy, whatever it is. The bard always seems to have something they can contribute to each turn of combat, which is great. On top of all these spells and cantrips, you will also be granted the bard's 
class defining ability. Bardic Inspiration is an ability you'll have access to three times per long rest at this level. And as you level up, you'll get more and more charges of this per day. So what does it do? Well, it's basically your bard giving another character some kind of magical pep talk. And what it actually results in is them adding a bonus to that character's next attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. At this level, the bonus they're going to add is 1d6, which is an absolutely massive bonus to be adding to dice rolls, especially at such a low level when you have, you know, barely any bonuses from anything. All of a sudden you're getting a 1 to 6 added to important rolls. Obviously you can't do it on every roll, but for the important ones. If you need to pass a check, have the old bard strum off some guitar riffs real quick and uh, try to pass that check. I need you to understand that this ability is so strong that it's actually absurd. This is the reason that everybody loves having bards in their parties, because not only, as you're going to see, are bards just good at everything, but they make everybody else a little bit better at everything too. You will also be allowed to choose three skills for which your bard is going to have proficiency, and you will have main stat points to allocate as well, just like always. The three main stats the bard typically wants to buff as they're leveling up are Charisma, Dexterity, and Constitution. Charisma is your spellcasting stat, which means that as you raise this, your spells are going to do more damage. It's going to make you a better caster, basically. And also it helps you in persuasion rolls, deception checks, intimidation checks, all that stuff. Dexterity will help your or bard with their armor class and their initiative rolls to potentially go earlier in combat, as well as influencing the damage that they do with certain weapons. And finally, constitution will determine how many hit points your character has, as well as how good they are at resisting having their concentration broken when they're concentrating on spells. So if you're planning on having your bard be more of a healer or a buff character to buff some of your allies, putting some points in constitution is definitely going to be strong because it'll help them concentrate concentrate on those spells to keep the buffs rolling on your party members. Now, let's go over what every bard's going to get as you're leveling up, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the subclasses like I said. Second level, your bard is going to gain one more level one spell slot, your choice of one more spell from the bard spell list, and as with every level up that you're going to get, you will also have the option to swap a spell that you know with a spell that you don't know if you want. This is entirely optional. If you like all the spells you have, you don't have to swap one. But know that every time you level up your bard, this is the only time you can swap out what spells your character knows unless you go talk to Withers. So if you end up with a list of spells by the end of the game that you just don't like, you can go talk to Withers, pay him some gold, respec your character, and you basically get to build your character from the ground up again. And then, since Withers is such a freaking gangster, he doesn't care about money. He makes you pay it just because. You can rob this dude blind. You can sit here and pickpocket him. He can catch you pickpocketing him 500 times. He does not care. He's never going to go hostile. He's never going to have any kind of negative consequences on your gameplay. Just steal your money back you can just take it back from him. He's basically like a savings account just sitting there holding your money for you until you need it. You will also be granted the Jack of All Trades passive ability, which will add half of your proficiency bonus rounded down to ability checks that you are not proficient in. So everyone understood that, right? No confusion at all? Good. All right, let's look at that a little bit better and figure out what the hell that actually means, shall we? Right now at this level, your bard's current proficiency bonus is plus two. So all three of those skills that you chose when you were creating your bard, and you chose proficiency in them, what that was doing was giving you a plus two to any kind of rolls or saving throws or ability checks that require that skill. Well, now that you have this jack of all trades buff, every other skill that you didn't choose now gets a plus one bonus to it, just because your bard's good at everything that they try, so they get a plus one to all of it right now, which is ridiculous. The jack of all trades buff, as we said before, it's half of your proficiency bonus rounded down. So as your proficiency bonus goes up while you're leveling up, so will your jack of all trades buff to 
to everything else that you're not proficient in. This right here is another class defining feature of the bard. This is where the jack of all trades, master of none thing comes from, except in this universe, bards are kind of like jacks of all trades, masters of most trades, and pretty freaking good at most of the other ones. They're like good at everything. But wait, there's more. On top of all that stuff we just discussed, you will also receive the Song of Rest ability at second level. This is a song that your bard can play while you're not in combat, and it has the same effects on your party as taking a short rest. So essentially, having a bard in your group gives your party an additional short rest per day. Easy enough. So obviously, regardless of what group makeup you have, having additional short rests is always good because you can use it to heal up in between fights. You can use it to replenish some resources based on what classes you have. And that's the kicker for certain group compositions or setups. If you have a lot of warlocks or maybe you want every character in your party to have devil's sight and your party can stand inside of the darkness spell and still function perfectly fine while no one else in the room can see them, because Warlock's packed spell slots replenish on short rest, having a bard in your group adding one more short rest per day to your group, that's one more time that your Warlock gets all of their packed slots back. And I made a Warlock video just recently. Some of you have seen it. I appreciate you watching it. Anyone who hasn't seen it, go ahead and watch it. It's, it's pretty good. I recommend it. But we talked about it over there. Warlocks don't get a lot of spell casts per day. That's one of the main drawbacks of being a warlock. But the spells that they cast are freaking, they're nukes. So adding more and more spell casts per day for a warlock is just super busted. This whole idea of taking multiple bards to have access to multiple songs of rest per day was actually recommended to me by one of you guys. And I really appreciate it. I love when you guys give me this information down in the comments. If you have a cool combination of spells or feet or uh, maybe one of the subclasses works really well with one of the race bonuses or something like that. Any kind of interactions like this, I live for this stuff. I love, love the little minutia. That's and there's no way in the world I'm going to learn it all on my own. So anything you guys are able to teach me, I'm eternally grateful for. And hopefully I'm teaching you guys some stuff too. So we'll all learn this crazy game together. How about that? And now that we're freaking 25 minutes into our discussion about second level, I think it's probably about time we move on to third level. Luckily, this one only has about 400 more things that your bard's going to get. So, you know, hopefully you're sitting down. First up, you're going to get to choose two of the skills that you already have proficiency in and gain expertise in them. What the heck does that mean? Expertise just doubles your proficiency bonus in those skills. So now you have skills that you're an expert at, so you have a double proficiency bonus, and then you have skills that you're proficient in, so you have your regular proficiency bonus, and then you have everything else which has half of your proficiency bonus just because you're a freaking bard and you're good at everything. You will gain another level one spell slot, two level two spell slots, and you're going to be allowed to choose another spell and swap a spell if you want, and now the spell list includes your bard's level two spells. You have access to those when you're choosing spells now. And then also, uh, one more little thing, you get to pick your bard's subclass at this level. Your options are going to be the knowledge seeker seeking spellcaster focused bards of the College of Lore, the inspiring leaders of the College of Valor, and the dancing blades of the College of Swords. As I said before, we're going to be taking a closer look at each one of these after we go through all the generic bard stuff. I just wanted to give you kind of the like lore implications of each bard subclass. We'll get into them though when we get to that part. So that being said, let's make our way to fourth level. First off, you're going to get another level two spell slot and a cantrip. You're going to get to choose another spell and swap one if you want. And importantly, at fourth level, your bard is going to get access to their first feat. Now, any of you have... Any of you who have seen any of my class guide videos knows what I'm about to say. Any of you who haven't, welcome to the video. I'm glad you're watching it. I appreciate it. Um, I'm sorry that uh, this is the face that you had to see when you clicked on it, but you know, thanks for being here. Anyway, as always, on your feet levels, feel free to look through the list of all the feats because there are some good options on this list. 
if something sounds like it would work well for your bard, or if it just sounds like it would be cool to try out, try it out, give it a shot. If it ends up not working out the way you want it to, or it's just not performing as highly, you know, you want to try something else out, no big deal. Go talk to Withers, like we said before, respect your character, and then you can rob your money back from him. It's not a problem. If you don't want to do this because you want to keep like a pure non-respect run, I understand that as well. If that's the case, just make sure you pay attention as you're choosing your feats. That way you know what you're getting yourself into. And as always, ability improvement is always, always a viable choice because in this game, your character's main stats are so powerful that just buffing your main stats is a super strong choice. Every time you get access to a feat, you could buff your main stats and you would be perfectly fine. You would not regret it, I about assure you. So once again, look through the list, pick something you want. If not, buff your stats. Let's move on. And now, travelers, we've made it to fifth level. This level is one of the biggest jumps in power that most classes in Baldur's Gate 3 get. And the Bard does get some incredible tools at this level, so let's take a look. Firstly, you're going to gain two level three spell slots. You're going to be allowed to choose a spell and swap one like normal. And the spell list now has access to your bard's level three spells, as you might have imagined. Do not underestimate the power of the spells that you're going to have on offer from this point forward. Level three spells are where things start to get crazy and it just keeps getting crazier from here on out. As your bard levels up though, you're going to realize there are not really any bad choices at some of these levels. So look at them, whatever fits your situation, it's going to be strong almost no matter what. At 5th level, your damaging cantrips are also going to have another damage die added to their damage rolls, so this is just helping your cantrips stay usable as you level up, because without them scaling up in damage like this, they would be completely worthless by the time you got the end game. You are also, at this level, going to get your 4th Bardic Inspiration Charge and your Bardic Inspiration Buff is going to go from being 1d6 to 1d8. Now, I went and googled this to look up how big of a percentage increase this is going from a d6 to a d8 because I'm not super well versed with these dice. Now, I'm about to drop some numbers and if these numbers are wrong, please feel free to correct me and I will pin your comment in a heartbeat. As far as I know, to the best of my knowledge, these numbers are correct. From what I could find, when you roll a d6, the statistically expected average roll is a 3.5. The average roll of a d8 is 4.5. So to keep this as simply as possible so that I don't confuse myself, it's not you I'm worried about, trust me, it's me, and I'm probably already confused. You're now adding one more on average to each roll that you buff when you're using Bardic Inspiration. This is an almost 30% increase to the potential of the buff, which is not bad at all. That's freaking huge. And then on top of all of that, we just got done going over how ridiculous Bardic Inspiration is now. You just got another charge of it, so now you have four, right? And they're 30% stronger now. Ridiculous. That's a freaking huge buff. Okay, sit down because you also get access to a passive ability called Font of Inspiration at 5th level. This one doesn't do a whole lot. It just makes it to where instead of getting your Bardic Inspiration charges back on only long rests, now you get them back from your short rests too. Do you know how many freaking short rests you get per day? Three. With just the one bard in your group, you're already up to three because of Song of Rest. So now you can use four Bardic Inspiration charges and then use your first short rest for the day, then four more Bardic Inspiration charges, second short rest for the day, four more Bardic Inspiration charges, Song of Rest, your third short rest of the day, four more Bardic Inspiration charges. You went from having three charges per long rest to six bardic inspiration uses per day 16 uses and they're buffed by 30 percent so after that ridiculous freaking avalanche of bonuses and buffs we just got at fifth level it's a good thing sixth level doesn't really have that much to offer because we need to take us a breather and slow down for a second 
Yeah, that was a lie. On top of another level three spell slot, and as always, your choice of a spell and your ability to swap one if you want, your bard will also be granted the counter charm ability, which is a buff you can use that will buff the bard and any allies within 30 feet for three turns, and the buff will grant them advantage on saving throws against being charmed or frightened. This is good to have. This is like uh, Calm Emotions, which is a spell that bards actually get access to later on. It can get you out of some really sticky situations if you have a bunch of your party members get charmed all of a sudden. Combat can very, very quickly go south. The enemies just get to do whatever the heck they want while you're running around doing their bidding as well. It's not a good situation to be in. You will also receive a very powerful subclass specific bonus at 6th level, and I could go into them here, but I'm gonna save them all for the subclass section, so we will get into those. Just know 6th level is massive and you're gonna be stoked to get these subclass things, so we'll talk about them when we get there. At 7th level your bard will gain 1 level 4 spell slot as well as a choice of a spell and a replacement spell if they want. And as you might imagine, their spell list now includes the level four bard spells. Every spell that's available on this level four bard list has a very strong use case in some way. So any of them are viable choices. You definitely need to read through each one of these and figure out what's gonna fit your party's needs the best. That's what you need to look into. Eighth level will grant your bard one more level four spell slot, their choice of a spell and a replacement if they want, and also their fifth bardic inspiration charge bringing you up to a total of 20 per day if you use all of your short rests. Once again, just like before, this is just another added level of group utility that the bard's gonna have access to. You will also be allowed to choose a second feat at eighth level. So just like we said at fourth level, look through the list. If something sounds cool, try it out. Go talk to Withers if you don't like it. If you just wanna buff your main stats, perfectly viable option. At ninth level, your bard's proficiency bonus is gonna increase to plus four. So let's recap. Your bard adds a plus four bonus to everything that they have proficiency with. They add a plus eight bonus to everything they have expertise with. And now they add a plus two bonus to everything else. Once again, they're just good at everything. You will also gain a level four spell slot, a level five spell slot, a choice of a spell and a replacement like always. And when you're choosing spells now, your list will include the level five bard spells. Once again, every single option available to you at this level is perfectly viable and has a super strong use case in some situations. You have three insanely powerful Powerful crowd control abilities, a big AoE heal, which is always good to have, a debuff cleanse, and a party-wide disguise self buff, which you can use to squeeze your party members into small cracks that they wouldn't normally fit through. If your character model is too large, you can sneak through those little holes and then you can change yourself back if you want. So this is not a bad level at all. You're going to get access to some really good tools. You're going to love to have these. Tenth level is also no slouch. You're going to get expertise in two more skills. You will also gain a second level five spell slot, choice of a spell and a replacement if you want, and a cantrip and also your cantrips are going to scale up in damage again by another damage die being added. So they're still usable when you run out of spell slots. And hold on to your friggin bagpipes because your bardic inspiration dice are getting buffed again. So instead of giving d8 bonuses from this point forward, your bard will be able to provide 1d10 bonuses when bardic inspiration is used to buff the roll. So let's get back to my potentially incorrect math. <laughs> and keep this train wreck going. Hopefully you guys are still watching the train wreck happening because, you know, I'm just, I keep wrecking it. So we'll just keep on doing this. Anyway, the average roll of a D8, as we said before, is 4.5. The average roll of a D10 is 5.5. So once again, you've added another one to the average expected roll. And as long as my math is not incorrect, that is a further 22% buff on the effectiveness of that Bardic Inspiration buff, which is great. And you have like 20 27,000 charges per day now. So you're going to be flinging out buffs left and right. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's absurd. I dare you to try to be in a group with a bard and not be inspired. And absurdly enough, that still isn't everything you get at 10th level. 
you will also be allowed to choose two spells from a special list called the Magical Secrets list. What's the deal with these, you're wondering? These will be non-barred spells from other class spell lists, and you can add a wide variety of tools to your bard's arsenal, from fireballs to lightning bolts to fireballs to lightning bolts to fireballs. I jest, but you get what I'm saying. You've got crowd control options, you've got pure damage options, pure healing options, buffs, debuffs, cleanses, a little bit of everything. You might be noticing a trend. That's the freaking trend for bards. That's what a bard is. A little bit of everything with a ridiculous hat on top and usually no pants, but I'm not going to stand up. 11th level will grant your bard their one and only level six spell slot. You're going to get to choose a spell and replace one like normal if you want. And now you have access to the bard's level six spells and because there's only two of these on the list we're gonna spotlight both of them because both of them are ridiculously good and i want to talk about both i bite and otto's irresistible dance both of these spells are level six crowd control spells that require concentration so with that being said let's figure out what these things do i bite which is a strange name but whatever i bite is a spell that will turn your bard's eyes into empty black voids of necromantic magic in doing this it will allow them to just by looking at somebody attempt to inflict them with one of three status debuffs as I said before, this is a concentration spell, and if you're able to maintain concentration, the caster can attempt to reapply one of these debuffs each turn as a cantrip without using a spell slot. So that can be really powerful. You can cause quite a bit of disruption in your enemy's team if you're able to get off multiple crowd control effects on different people. The three debuff choices you're going to have are Anicked, Sickened, and Asleep. Each one of these has different saving throws, different situations where they're going to be more useful. Sometimes people are immune to being put to sleep, but they can be feared and you can hit them with panic. It just depends on what kind of situation you're in. Having access to multiple types of crowd control in one spell is very strong. It's always nice to have choices. Otto's Irresistible Dance is probably one of the strongest crowd control abilities in the entire game, without any exaggeration, though its range is only half of what you get with iBite. So what is it and why is it so good? Well, Otto's will allow you to target an enemy and force them to dance in place for up to 10 turns. While they are dancing, they can't move or take any other actions, they have disadvantages advantage on attack rolls and dexterity saving throws, and any attacks made against them will have advantage. And also, they're stuck here river dancing the night away like a ridiculous fool. Alright then, it's enough of that. So yeah, I mean, this is a crowd control ability, but why all the hype that I gave it at the beginning? Well, uniquely, when you cast Otto's Irresistible Dance on somebody, they are not given the opportunity to make a saving throw against it immediately. So what this means is, basically short of you getting counterspelled when you cast it, which will happen sometimes, and it is going to waste that person's next turn. So this is an almost guaranteed at least one turn of crowd control against that one target, which is busted in certain situations. Being able to guarantee a turn of crowd control can absolutely save your life in a bad situation. Don't sleep on it. Plus, look at how much fun they're having. Look at this. You don't want to be this guy? God, look at the horror on their face, though. They're like, and finally, ladies and gentlemans, we've reached the final level of our journey. At 12th level, you will get to choose a spell, replace a spell for the final time, if you wish, and you will also have access to your third and final feat. Same deal as at 4th level and 8th level. If there's any feats you're interested in, look into them. If not, buff your main stats and call it a day. And that's it. That's all the bonuses and passives that every bard is going to get as you level up. So what we're going to do now is go backwards in time, back to third level, where we chose our subclass, and we're going to start with the College of Lore. Take a look at that. <laughs> 
You pursue beauty and truth, collecting knowledge from scholarly tomes to peasants' tales, and use your gifts to hold both audiences and enemies spellbound. Upon first choosing the College of Lore subclass, your bard will immediately receive proficiency in three more skills of your choice. Yeah, that's right. At this level, lore bards get twice as many skills to be proficient with. And we've already talked about how ridiculous bards get with proficiencies and half proficiencies and double proficiencies and all that. So these guys just get even more ridiculous proficiencies. Lore bards will also receive the cutting words ability. This is a reaction you can trigger when an enemy is performing an attack roll, an ability check, or a saving throw. It will cost a reaction as well as one of your bardic inspiration charges, and it will basically add a negative bardic inspiration debuff to that person's roll. So lore bards can do bardic inspiration on their allies, just like normal. You can still do all the normal stuff to buff your own rolls, or cutting words is essentially the exact opposite against your enemy's rolls when they make them. So you can also do that if you want now. When your Bardic Inspiration dice upgrade, your Cutting Words debuff will upgrade by the same amount. Like we said before, D6s have a 3.5 average roll. At this level, negative 3.5 average when you're using Cutting Words. That's busted. And then as you level up, you'll get up to a negative 4.5, up to a negative 5.5 average. This debuff is absolutely bonkers and you are going to love it. At 6th level, lore bards get to choose two spells from that magical secrets list we talked about earlier. That list of spells that were the non-bard spells. Well, the lore bards, being the spellcaster focused bards, get to choose two spells at level 6 as well as the two that all bards get at level 10. The restriction is that since we're level 6, you only have access to the level 3 or below spells from the Magical Secrets list, which sucks because, you know, there's nothing good at that level to choose. It's a real shame, I tell you. That's it. Those are all the bonuses you get for a lore bard. So all bards get most of the same stuff. The differences, though, are while they're not that many differences, they're big ones. And we're about to figure that out. The lore bards are more spellcasting focused. You get access to more spells, more variety of spells from other classes. This is a very, very strong choice. If you want your bard to be more of a ranged caster or more of a healer or anything of that nature, College of Lore is absolutely the way to go for sure. So with with that being said, let's head back to third level and we'll check out what the College of Valor has on offer. You wander the land to witness and relate the deeds of the mighty, keeping alive the memory of heroes of the past and inspiring heroes of the future. Valor bards are very different from their College of Lore counterparts with just the few minimal changes that we're going to talk about here. You could have a very different character by building it this way. When you first choose College of Valor, you'll immediately be granted proficiency in medium armor, shields, and martial weapons. So basically, this gives your bard access to all gear in the game except for heavy armor. That's it. So now your bard has the tools they need to be a capable frontline fighter if you want to play them that way. On top of this, just like the lore bard, how they got cutting words as an upgrade to bardic inspiration, all of the subclasses get a variation of the bardic inspiration skill. The valor bard's version is called combat inspiration. You can use it just like regular bardic inspiration, just like before. It has all the same stuff that you've had from the beginning, but you can also add the bonus to either the target's armor class or their next damage roll. So just think about that. Adding a 1d10 to somebody's damage later on in the game, that's ridiculous. Once again, six levels and utter disappointment. All you get is this stupid extra attack ability and no one, what the hell is this? Larian, what, what am I supposed to do with this? Just like casually double how good my bard is from now on? Okay. 
So yeah, obviously that was also a joke. Extra attack is absolutely busted. What this does is it lets your bard have two attacks per action from this point forward. So if you use haste or potions of speed, you can end up stacking up multiple attacks per turn on top of these. It's It can lead to a crazy amount of attacks per turn. Do note, however, that if you're playing in honor mode, the haste action won't let you do two attacks. From what I understand, this is actually how it's supposed to work in D&D. So we've kind of actually been spoiled in Baldur's Gate 3 up until now. But I think Larian just changed it for honor mode difficulty only. I don't think they have any plans to change this for the other difficulties. But obviously they could at any moment. So just keep an eye on that. Just know, you know, uh, three attacks is better than two and four attacks is better than three. So if you can get more attacks per turn, do it. Just do more attacks per turn. It's easy as that. So as you can see, like I said, there wasn't that many changes, but the changes that there were between the lore and Valor Bards are massive. The differences are big enough where you could have two bards in your group and both of them could fill totally different roles and still have two completely viable characters in your group. So it's good. The bard is good at everything. They can fill pretty much every role. And now we're going to rewind one more time back to third level. We're going to take a look at our third and final subclass, the College of Swords. Bards of the College of Swords are called Blades, and they entertain through daring feats of weapon prowess. Since the description literally says that they're called Blades, and that's much easier to say than College of Swords Bard, I'm going to be calling them Blades from now on, unless there's a sentence that already ends with the word Blades, and it would just be confusing. It's not easy to keep up with. Did you see that Blades, Blades? Yeah, that Blades, Blades were very Blades, Blades, Blades. You see the wire, what? Over. Over! Okay, immediately upon choosing this subclass, you are going to be granted proficiency with medium armor and scimitars. So you don't get quite as many options with the blade as you do with the Valor Bard, but still more choices here. What you will get that the College of Valor Bard does not get is your choice of a fighting style from one of two choices, either dueling or two weapon fighting. Dueling is fantastic if you're using a one handed weapon in your main hand and either a shield or nothing in your off hand. If you meet these requirements, dueling will add plus two to any damage rolls that you deal with that main hand weapon. And that might not sound like much, but adding a plus two to every damage roll that that weapon does is a ridiculous amount of damage, especially over the course of a playthrough. Hundreds and hundreds of damage you'll be adding. Two weapon fighting, on the other hand, will add your character's ability score modifier to their rolls when they attack with their offhand. Basically, this is required if you're intending to play your bard as a dual wielding damage dealing class because without this buff, your offhand attacks are pretty pitiful. With this buff, your offhand attacks are very strong. And finally, the blade will receive Blade Flourish. I wonder why they named it that. This is their upgrade to Bardic Inspiration. As before, you can still use Bardic Inspiration for the regular buff to your allies if you want. You still have access to that. None of the bard subclasses loses access to the regular Bardic Inspiration buff, which is great because having those buffs is awesome. Blade Flourish gives your bard access to a bunch of skills that they can use in combat. These are basically like combat maneuvers from the fighter class. It's basically three choices and there's a melee and ranged variation of each choice. So there's six skills. One of them will add armor class to you when you land a hit on somebody with it, which is great. It's an offensive and defensive attack, which is great. There's one that will allow you to attack multiple people with one hit, which is fantastic, especially if you're doing multiple attacks per turn. Now you're attacking multiple people with each. That can add up to a ridiculous amount of damage. And finally, you have the option to knock enemies away from you and then teleport to them. So for, for different situations, obviously these are very, very viable. You get access to all of them. You can mix and match. You can use one of them for your first attack, a different one for the second attack. Just use whatever you need in the situation you're in, especially since you end up with like 45 bardic inspiration charges or whatever it was we said earlier, some absurd amount, 69 charges, something like that. Nice. 
that was all just the third level bonuses too. That was all stuff you just get right away for choosing College of Swords. At sixth level, just like the College of Valor Bard, the blade will receive extra attack. Same deal as before, you get multiple attacks per action now. As we just said, you start stacking some of these combat maneuver things on top of that. You can have a ridiculous amount of hits per turn, striking multiple people, causing status debuffs on them. It's, it's crazy. That's it for the final subclass. The Blades of the College of Swords. The Blades Blades. These guys are the fancy blade dancers. Spinning and twirling around, firing off crossbow bolts left and right, or flourishing their scimitar gracefully, slashing down multiple foes at the same time. Also, don't forget, even though the last two subclasses we talked about have the tools you need to be up close and personal, they absolutely still have the tools to be a full-on range spellcaster if you need them to do that. So, if you need to retreat and drop back to being a healer for your group or something, guess what? The bard good at that. Also, I definitely recommend taking at least one ranged healing spell of some kind because, especially if you're playing in honor mode, being able to get off a heal on somebody across the room and bring them back from being downed and possibly save them from getting killed completely, I could save your whole run. I'm telling you right now, little things like that in honor mode make a big difference. So now that we've seen what each bard gets as they level up and what each subclass has to offer you, I want to talk about a couple of notable bards from other popular media, and then I want to make a case for that super secret bard in disguise that we talked about earlier. The first three bards that I wanted to talk about are very similar in a lot of ways, and I've actually been using footage of each of them in this video already. First off, Scanlan Short Halt from Vox Machina. If you haven't seen Vox Machina, Legend of Vox Machina, I highly, highly recommend it. It's an animated show based on the campaign that Critical Role ran, and they translated this over to an animated show super well. Highly recommend. If you've not seen it, definitely go check it out. Second up, Dandelion or Yaskier from the Witcher series. It's harder for me to recommend the Netflix Witcher series because of the whole Henry Cavill situation. I really liked Henry Cavill in that role. It's just, it's not as good as Vox Machina was to me. But The Witcher 3 video game, I did play and it was fantastic. And I highly recommend that one. You run into Dandelion in the game, which is one of Geralt's friends, and he is the bard. He's the toss a coin to your Witcher guy from the show. Also, Yaskier, fantastic character. And thirdly, Edgen Darvis from the Dungeons and Dragons movie, Honor Among Thieves. If you haven't seen this movie, it's actually fantastic. I really, really had a good time watching this thing. And the main character, Edgen, obviously Chris Pine, is a fantastic actor and he did a freaking hilarious job in this movie. You're gonna love this character. So definitely check it out. I highly recommend this one. The thing about these characters, the similarities, they're all very witty, they're charismatic, they're sarcastic, they're very intelligent. Even if they don't normally act that way, they are. They're very intelligent, cunning, very good at coming up with schemes and plans too. And each and every one of them has at some point or another acted as the beating heart of their group and were able to inspire their allies to overcome important obstacles. It's also these traits that led me to consider the super secret hidden surprise bard in disguise that I mentioned earlier, Peter Quill, much more commonly known as Star-Lord. I know, I know, I can hear the groans from here. Oh man, yeah, this isn't really a Sherlock Holmes level discovery here, but surely someone out there didn't make this connection, so I'm gonna bring it up. I'm a huge comic book nerd. Uh, any opportunity I get to talk about a comic book character when I'm talking about Dungeons & Dragons stuff as well, if I can combine these two things, tch, oh man, love it. It's two birds with one stone. For any of you that doesn't actually know who Star-Lord is, that's fine. He's the main character of the Guardians of the Galaxy, the leader of the group, the Guardians of the Galaxy, and absolutely witty, charismatic, intelligent, even though he doesn't normally act like it, inspires his allies to go above and beyond and break through their limits and freaking music is like this dude's whole shtick his whole thing is music he's 
always listening to his mixtapes that his mom gave him before she died. And that is the soundtrack of the movies. So these movies have ridiculously good music in them. And it's woven into the story because Star-Lord's a damn bard. So what do you think? Is Star-Lord a bard or am I just grasping at straws here? I feel like there's no question that he's got at least a couple of levels dipped into Bard. I Come on now. You guys got to give me at least something. He's at least multi-classed Bard. But let me know in the comments. What do you think about the Bard class? What is your favorite Bard subclass? Are there any other notable Bards from other popular media sources that I didn't mention that you guys think are cool, worth talking about? What's your favorite dinosaur? Let us know the answer to all these important questions down in the comments below. And while you're down there, be sure to click the like and subscribe buttons if you like this video and want to see more of this type of content and hit the notification bell if you want to be notified as soon as I upload content as well. I do appreciate any and all support you guys have been giving me. The support on this these videos has been really really awesome to see so thank you for that. As always travelers I'm glad you got to see me. Do your best to stay alive. Until next time. See ya.